I've been asked by Church Publishing to read some of the devotionals out of this book entitled Finding Shelter. It's an autumn companion, and I encourage you to pick up one for your own library or buy it as a gift for a friend. I'm going to be reading from Meditation 24 entitled Death for the Sake of Life. And I'm going to begin with a, a reading from John's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 23 through 25. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Volumes have been written on the death of Jesus. So there's no need here to offer much more than the obvious. Jesus did come, as noted earlier in the book, out of God's love for us. But all that Jesus did and said put down stepping stones to his crucifixion, his death on the cross for our sins. His death was not a good example it was not merely revealing that God and Jesus was so good and so loving that he would prove to die for a point. Now, we are told throughout the Gospels, throughout the New Testament, that Jesus died in Mark's telling to give his life as a ransom for many, from Mark 10, 45. John's Gospel, the fourth Gospel, also written after Matthew, Mark, and Luke around the year 90 in the Common Era, reveals his poetic writing. Different from the other Gospels, it is a beautiful and horrible retelling of what his Gospel brothers had already written, that the shadow of the cross loomed over the crib in the manger. In this passage from John, Jesus let his disciples know that his hour has come, and that his remaining days would take decidedly deeper and more terrifying directions. Jesus' death, as he tells his followers here, is the moment that actually allows his power to do what it came to do. We'll unpack this more in the devotionals ahead, but let me borrow a bit from this season. While many of us typically associate spring with allergy season, I live in a part of the country now where fall brings allergies as well. In fact, I rarely had allergy issues until I moved to Houston, Texas, but I have them now, a plenty, and the way out has been injections of antigens. An allergy antigen is actually a small bit of the substance that makes you allergic. If you put a bit of this into you long enough, eventually it provokes immunity to the thing that was causing the reaction in the first place. Regular, consistent exposure to the allergens has actually reduced their power over me, allowing my body to resist those things that seem to be dominating my respiratory system. Now, this may be a stretch for some, but let me suggest that Jesus' death is the ultimate antigen for those things from which our souls suffer. Sin, guilt, and yes, death. Jesus' death actually disarms the power of death over us. And the more we think on that and pray on that, the more we give ourselves over to the reality that Jesus did not just die because he was a nice guy trying to show others that self-sacrifice is a noble vocation, but instead that Jesus died so that you and I might live. The Reverend Fleming Rutledge has put this powerfully in her book on the crucifixion, writing, Without the cross at the center of the Christian proclamation, the Jesus story can be treated as just another story about a charismatic spiritual figure. It is the crucifixion that marks out Christianity as something definitively different in history of all religion. It is in the crucifixion that the nature of God is truly revealed. Since the resurrection is God's mighty, trend-historical, yes, to the historically crucified Son, 
we can assert that the crucifixion is the most important historical event that has ever happened. There's not one of us who does not desperately want the gifts offered through Jesus' death. Though we may, in our modern world, shrink back from the stark truths revealed in the cross of Christ, it would be to our own detriment. For without Jesus' cross, there would be no Christian faith. In fact, the promises of what rests beyond the grave would be null and void. Death would mean death and nothing more. Yet it is more than that, isn't it? Heinrich Suso died in 1366. A German Dominican friar once wrote, The cross possesses such power and strength that whether they like it or not, it attracts and draws and carries away those who bear it. Through the lens of Jesus' death and our trust in that death, we're promised life. Life abundant here and life yet to come beyond death's sting. His death is, in fact, a death for life's sake, for your life's sake. That's to lay claim to that gift, for that is, in the end, what it is. A new leaf. The British evangelist, Alan M. Stibbs, who died in 1971, wrote, This one event of the cross of Christ is a final revelation both of the character and consequence of human sin and the wonder and sacrifice of divine love. Take some time today and reflect on the reasons why Jesus gave his life for you. Consider then how this shifts the cross of Jesus from the tops of steeples and gravestones, from t-shirts and necklaces to the very center of our faith. What can we do in the face of that truth but to give our thanks? A prayer uh, written by Augustus Tapledi, died in 1778. It's actually uh, the hymn, Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side that flowed be of sin the double cure, cleanse me from its guilt and power. Should my tears forever flow, should my zeal no languor know, all for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. In my hand no price I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. While I draw this fleeting breath, when mine eyelids close in death, when I rise to worlds unknown, and behold thee on thy throne, rock of ages, cleft for me, I may hide myself in thee. Amen.